Hello and welcome. Fleet Maintenance Magazine presents this webcast, Heavy Duty Engine Oil, The Road Ahead, brought to you by Sitco Heavy Duty Lubricants, the maker of high-quality Sitco lubricating oils. I'm David A. Coleman, the editor of Fleet Maintenance Magazine, and it's my privilege and pleasure to serve as your webinar moderator. You know, for nearly 20 years, API Heavy Duty Engine Oil had only two performance categories, API CD1970 and API CE. Then a few years ago, an additional category, CJ4, came along. It's anticipated that as we move forward, API engine performance categories will be introduced about every three to four years. And that's because of a range of factors and influences requiring new and improved oil formulations for today's heavy-duty engines. With us today to discuss what's on the road ahead for heavy-duty engine oils is Mark Bettner, the heavy-duty product manager for Sitco Lubricants. Mark has 35 years of experience in the lubricants business, the past 23 years with Sitco Lubricants. Mark has a degree in chemistry and biology, which is an interesting combination, and he's a member of the Technology and Maintenance Council. He holds a certification from the Society of Tribologists and Lubrication Engineers, and if you're not familiar with that organization, its mission is twofold, to advance the science of friction, lubrication, and wear, and to advance the practice of lubrication engineering. Suffice it to say, Mark truly knows lubrication. Now, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. You can participate in today's webcast by submitting your questions to Mark. To do that, simply type your questions into the question window box that's on the bottom right of your screen, and then hit the Submit button. We're going to be answering as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow Mark's presentation. However, please feel free to send along your questions at any time, and we'll add them to the queue. If at any time during your slideshow it doesn't seem to advance, simply press F5 on your keyboard, and that will refresh your browser. And let me note that after today's live event, this webcast will be archived and available to viewers at Fleet Maintenance Magazine Online in the Media Center's webcast section. Now, without further ado, may I present Sitco Lubricants Heavy Duty Product Manager, Mark Bettner. Well, thank you, David. Look forward to visiting with our guest today. I know many of you are from the transportation industry, and many of you supply to this transportation industry. So I'm looking forward to our visit today and talking about heavy-duty engine oil, the road ahead. I think what we we're going to cover today is four areas. Uh, we're going to talk about the road to clean and fuel-efficient diesels. We're going to talk how engine oil relates to this new agenda of reducing greenhouse gases and improving miles per gallon in heavy-duty equipment. Thirdly, we'll talk about low viscosity and fuel-efficient engine oil on the brink and what this, uh, how this marks a milestone from where we've come. And last, I want to end up, end up with the engine oil basic economics. You can look on this slide and you can see uh, these beautiful diesel powered machines actually make it possible to live the way we do today. They, uh, they supply us everything that we, we need in our daily lives. So this is important that we uh, know what's going on with these machines today. The first thing I want to talk about is the road to clean and fuel efficient diesels. My goodness, what a uh, what a journey we've covered. Now, the slide you're looking at now is kind of interesting. Only in America would we see two Class 8 tractors at a drag race. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? But actually, the truck on the left is reminiscent of days gone by where black smoke was common on, on a highway. In fact, some of us even thought the black smoke was an indicator of diesel power of the day. Now, the truck on the right looks a lot better, but by today's clean diesel standards, it's not even nearly good enough. So let's move forward and see 
what's going on, what has taken us here from the late 1980s to where we're at today. It's an amazing American engineering feat, in my opinion, of what's happened. I'm going to take you back prior to 2002. Some of it's a little bit technical, but in the late 80s, we became aware that we were going to have to clean diesels up. Uh, that black smoke, which we once ex accepted uh, on highway, off highway, American Engineering, the emission mandates that were required prior to 2002, we were able to actually go inside the anatomy of a diesel engine and do some changes, as well as some electronic changes, and meet those emission mandates. What you're looking at here is uh, is a couple pistons out of a diesel engine, older diesel engines. You notice the one on the left is labeled older, and you can fairly well see that there is some difference in those configurations. There's a those of you familiar with diesel engine, that top land area is, is much wider on the older versus the newer. The thing you can't see is that they narrowed down the gaps between the diesel engine liner and the piston land to reduce the type of particulate material that would enter back into the combustion and eventually in the exhaust. But we were able to do that all internally at the time until 2002. 2002, the next emission reduction in diesels required going outside the engine. In other words, having external changes. The technology of choice was called EGR, exhaust gas recirculation. This is where they took part of the exhaust gases and rerouted them back to the com combustion. What an innovative thing, because in doing that, we were able to reduce the NOx or NOx, there was a bit of a compromise, though, because in reducing the NOx, we actually created some soot, which, and we had to do something with that soot, and guess where that went? It couldn't go out the exhaust, so it went down in the crankcase. But EGR did give us what we needed to meet that 2002 level. 2007 was another plateau in, in emission reduction. EGR was not quite enough, so we added another technology to the on-highway truck called a DPF, or diesel particulate filter, which would trap more of those partic particulates that would escape into our clean air. And it did the job. So now we have exhaust gas recirculation plus diesel particulate filter, and we meet the 2007, I call it phase three. The next, in 2010, was a major milestone where we had to take one more quantum leap, I call it, in reducing emissions coming out of heavy-duty diesel. In addition to exhaust gas recirculation and adding diesel particulate filters, we added a technology called SCR, Selective Catalytic Reduction. How interesting. They took a substance called aqueous ammonia. Most suppliers call it, by its acronym, DEF, diesel exhaust fluid. And by injecting diesel exhaust fluid into the exhaust stream, it would act as a reductant on NOx and further take us to that next level of unbelievable clean diesel. You can see on this truck here that there's a, actually a DEF tank there. It holds anywhere from about 20 to 25 gallons, and that's injected at a 2% feed rate. A truck that burns about 20,000 gallons of diesel a year will use about 400 gallons of that to help us reduce that NOx that uh, would have come out of that engine. And, of course, you see the SCR catalyst on, on the other side there. So that's the I've, we've come about almost 20 years there in the technology changes that got us to where we're at today. But let's uh, also talk just briefly. Off-highway, a valuable part of our heavy-duty world, the same technology is actually being applied to off-road diesels as well in what we call the T4 emissions companies like this featured are using diesel exhaust fluid and selective catalytic reduction. So the same technology is applying to off-road. They're doing it a little differently, and they're basing the emission levels on horsepower ratings uh, in off-road. But this does apply to off-road as well. I want to show you here, you've possibly seen this uh, picture before, but it helps visualize what we've accomplished with diesel emission reduction technology. As you can see, those boxes, the vertical axis, NOx, I call it purple stuff. Why do I call it purple stuff? Well, 
if you've heard the word smog, you know that NOx can contribute to what appears to be a purple-looking cloud above major metropolitan areas, and that's a result of excessive NOx. Along the horizontal axis, PM, particulate matter, is the black stuff. That's the stuff that we looked at earlier on those two trucks at the uh, drag strip. But we wanted to reduce both of these significantly in the exhaust stream of a diesel engine. And you can see in 94, the allowance of 5 grams per brake horsepower was a quantum leap different from what we have today in that little green box in the lower left-hand corner. But each of the emission mandates took us down to a cleaner and cleaner level. We now, in 2012, on-highway production diesel engines are so clean that they're in that little green box in there. And let me put that in perspective for you here. Let me just show you how amazing that reduction is. One truck in 1988 produced emissions equivalent to 200 trucks coming off the assembly line today. It's interesting that a diesel engine requires 200 gallons of air to burn one gallon of diesel, and they produce about 22.5 pounds of byproducts by chemical weight. So what we've done amounts to millions and millions of tons of reduced emissions going into the air. You've got to give tribute to the great American engineering that go into building these diesel engines. It's quite an amazing feat that they've accomplished here, folks. Um, now, what's next on the horizon? About the time you think things are going to settle down, right? Uh, as David mentioned, from 1970 to 88, we only had two API performance classification categories for heavy duty diesel. And since 1988, We've gone all the way from a letter in the alphabet deal all the way up to J, and, and that represents the changes in the heavy diesel. But now a new development has occurred. The Obama administration, along with members of the industry, transportation industry, has signed legislation that will go into effect in 2014 and 2018, and it's targeted toward making diesels more fuel efficient and reducing the carbon footprint and reducing greenhouse gases coming from diesels. It's interesting probably in a way to what in a big rig, a class 8 tractor trailer, 18 wheelers we call them, where does all the energy go? Well these are the things that are being targeted to where we can improve the fuel efficiency of diesel engines and reduce the CO2. Actually the 2014 mandate is based on reducing CO2 in grams per ton mile. But energy losses occur from aerodynamics, braking, rolling resistance. Uh, I participated in a seminar a while back where a tar manufacturer representative made an interesting comment. The only thing on the truck that meets the road is the tire. So it kind of makes sense that rolling resistance from tire design would have impact on energy losses and auxiliary loads and drivetrain all go into where energy goes in a vehicle. So these are the things that are being looked at. And in summary of those things, the 2014 drivers to meet the fuel efficiency mandate have to do with aerodynamics, how much resistance that truck has as it goes down the highway. I saw, I was driving on the highway the other day here in the Houston area where a, a cab over. You hardly ever see one of those anymore. Flat front, <laughs> you can imagine the air resistant on that vehicle compared to the modern aerodynamic looking cabs we have on the highway today. Loads and idle time reduction. Idle time, what is that? That's, that's when the engine is running to provide air conditioning and heat creature comforts to the operator, of course, but it's at the cost of up to about a gallon of diesel fuel an hour for idle time. And of course, tires could all make a difference in meeting that 2014 mandate. And it's important to know that we have technology now that will meet that. You can, you can spec a truck today that will deliver on those four, four things. And I might add, when we go to 2018, that's a whole different ballgame. Uh, what you're seeing now is a slide of how we're going to break down the fuel efficiency targets for diesel-powered equipment ranging from heavy-duty pickups and vans where the target would be up to a 15% improvement in fuel efficiency. Vocational vehicles such as delivery trucks, buses, and refuse trucks, where we expect about a 10% approximate 
uh, improvement in fuel efficiency, and of course tractor trailers, where we expect up to a 20% improvement in fuel efficiency. Now I want to put that in perspective in a second. 20% is a quantum leap when you think about a tractor going 100,000 miles a year to generate enough revenue to stay in business, averaging about 6.5 miles per gallon, which equates to about 20,000 gallons of fuel a year. How would you like to get that bill for fuel driving a Class 8 truck? But folks, when we talk about percentages of fuel, and fuel improvement, we must put that in perspective. One percent of anything to, to a diesel-powered vehicle at $4 fuel is worth about $800 a year per power unit. So you can see where these things could add up to tremendous cost, cost advantages as we start to look at the opportunities that technology will provide us. More specific targets will be based on design and purpose of vehicle. For example, a semi-truck with a low roof versus a high roof. There would be different targets for that, and fuel efficiency gains will be charted each year for the vehicle category and type. So that's where we're headed, folks, towards 2018. And why are we headed there? Well, let's take a look at another graphic here that will explain what's been going on. The red line shows the improvement in fuel efficiency for passenger cars since 1970. It's been quite interesting how we've improved fuel efficiency in today's automobiles, especially sedans, where you see uh, you see advertisements on television where it's not uncommon to see uh, a, a manufacturer uh, say that they're improving fuel efficiency up to 38 miles per gallon. Think back to the 60s when cars <laughs> wouldn't come close to that, uh, and yet have the power that they have have today. Vans and pickup trucks have also improved, but look at the look at the truck issue there. It's been basically static since 1970, and you could say, you know, somewhere in the 6.5 mile per gallon range, that's been static. So that's what's on the target now to to change that curve fuel efficiency in heavy duty. Uh, I've put this slide in there because uh, this is a strange looking vehicle. We, along with several other sponsors, are sponsoring this truck. It's uh, independently owned. It's called the Airflow Truck. It, uh, it is achieving about 20% plus fuel efficiency right now. We don't have time to go through all the technological uh, advantages that have been built into this truck. You can see some of them, obviously the aerodynamics, uh, the skirting, the really interesting front end of that truck, which represents the ultimate in airflow uh, improvement. It has a waterless coolant in there, which changes the thermal efficiency of the diesel engine. It has an API unit that allows you to shut down the diesel engine, and that's just one uh, technology that will allow you to shut down the engine. Uh, idle time, of course, not the only. It, and it has a a different tire and tread, uh, tread design on it. And last but not, not least, it has a, what we're going to talk about here is a low viscosity fuel efficient engine oil in it. Uh, you might see on the side of the trailer something interesting. America could save $10 million a day on fuel. And, and what we're referring to there is going from a conventional 15W40 oil to low viscosity tech, uh, technology. America this great nation we live in needs diesel fuel to keep all these machines running. We, we burn about 65 billion gallons of diesel a year. And based on the percentages I'm going to share with you, if, if, if hypothetically we today changed vehicles from a conventional viscosity, 1540, to a low viscosity technology, which I will define what low viscosity means, America, believe it or not, would save about $10 million in fuel costs. Isn't that interesting to think that viscosity of an oil might have that kind of an impact. Okay, so got a question for you here. Take a little uh, mind break here. If a typical line haul truck tractor improves fuel economy by 20 percent, which is, by the way, what we're targeting up to the 2018 fuel efficient goal or target, by approximately how much will this reduce the annual fuel consumption? 200 gallons? 4,000 gallons, 400 gallons, or 20,000 gallons. I'm going to give you a few seconds to think about this, and then we'll uh, 
will give you the answer. Wow, I'm pretty impressed. We've got a uh, very academic audience here. The answer is 4,000 gallons. And that was based on, remember I said if the average Class 8 line haul truck goes about 100,000 miles a year, averages about 6.5 miles per gallon, that truck is going to require about 20,000 gallons of diesel fuel a year. And 20% reduction would meet 4,000 gallons. Now, think about that a minute. Let's take that beyond the 4,000 gallons. Diesel fuel ranging from 350 to $4 a gallon, that's worth anywhere from 12 to $16,000 a year per power unit. So everything that represents a percent has tremendous cost-saving opportunity in the transportation industry. Okay, let's, let's move on to the next topic, engine oil, the road ahead, greenhouse gases, and miles per gallon. So we want to bring this narrow, this story more as how engine oil fits into the equation. Well, let me show you a little bit. Boy, I tell you, we love in this industry, we love alphabet. We, we love letters. <laughs> it fits with all the specifications and everything we do in the lubricant industry. But let me take you back 60 years. When people ordered engine oil in the 50s and 60s, uh, what did you refer to for performance? Uh, one major engine manufacturer uh, had a identification. They referred to as Series 1 or Series 3. That was a performance reference to what they expected in their engines. Series 3 was for turbocharged diesel engines. Series 1 was for naturally aspirated. But people would often order their oil, have you got any Series 3 oil? Along with that, something else of interest. Prior to the late 70s, diesel engines were happily lubricated with a single or, or monograde engine oil. The engine design, it worked well. In fact, in the northern states, they would even switch to a 10 weight in the winter just to improve coal cranking and fluidity of the oil. But the 30 weight oil was a very popular grade. But as engineering developments occurred in the late 70s, major engine builders discovered that what we now call multigrade oils, oils that would behave like a 15 W, and by the way, W stands for winter, an oil that would, at startup time, would flow like a 15 oil, but had the capability, due to additive engineering, to change to a 40 weight as the engine temperature increased. That was a beautiful idea. You got good flow when it's cold. You got higher viscosity when the engine's warm. I I have to tell you a real quick quick story. In, in the early 80s, I visited with a large transportation fleet manager. However, and I my purpose in that visit was to share with him why he could benefit from a 1540 and move away from a single grade oil in a four-stroke diesel engine. He was very polite. I told him that. 1540 can reduce oil consumption, it can reduce upper engine deposits, and reduce engine wear. He kind of patted me on the back, and I was a lot younger then. He said, I, I appreciate you coming here and sharing this with me, but I want you to do something for me. And I said, what is that? And he said, I want you to go back to your engineering friends and tell them that 1540 will never work in a diesel engine. Okay, why would I share that story with you? Well, as we move forward in time... We're going to talk about some other viscosity grades, but to uh, 2007, we had another milestone. We had to change the formulation to be compatible with that diesel particular filter that I talked about earlier. It turned out that the amount of additive that we had in heavy-duty diesel oils could potentially shorten the service life of the diesel particulate filter. So we changed the chemical formulation in a way that would optimize the life of the diesel particular uh, filter, and that brought in what we now call CJ4 oils. Well, let's look ahead just a bit here. 
it now, the engine makers have already petitioned for a new American Petroleum Institute API service category. There are a couple things, major things involved. They want to see some improved performance capability in some areas such as oxidation and shear stability of the oil. In other words, the multigrade's ability to stay in grade over time, the impact of biodiesel on oils, but they also want to see what impact engine oil can have on fuel efficiency. This proposed Category 11 has been petitioned, and if it's followed through, it will likely become the next letter in the American Petroleum Institute performance category alphabet, which would be CK. Now, you notice right down, down below there, I've got some viscosity grades that are not unfamiliar to many people on the Online, but I can tell you, remember that story I told you about changing from 30 weight to 1540? Think about how do you feel about these viscosity grades right now? Will they work? Won't they work? Will they really improve fuel? We'll talk a little more about them, but it's viscosity on the, on the brink. Next. Okay? All right. So now let's quickly now take that same emission chart that we showed earlier for what we have done with reducing emissions in diesel engines, and now let's apply these API performance categories to those various emission reduction stages in diesel engines. You'll quickly notice that each time we reduce the emissions in diesel engines, which resulted in engine design changes, we also had to change the performance level of the oil because the stress that was being put on the oil as a result of the engine design changes required improved performance overall. In fact, I'm going to share with you just how much difference real quick there was between CI4 and CJ4, and I'm going to pop something up on the screen here. What is soot anyway? It's, it's very much like charcoal, isn't it? When we went with EGR in 2002, and developed CJ4 in 2007, we fully expected that the engines were going to have a lot more soot in the crankcase. In fact, what we discovered when we introduced CJ4 technology, that CJ4s were so much better at managing soot, and when I say managing soot, the key is to keep the oil in the, in the, in the viscosity grade, in the original viscosity grade range, without thickening and causing premature oil filter plugging, cold weather starting problems. All these are problems that soot can cause. CJ4 oils can actually handle twice as much soot as CI4. In other words, CJ4 was truly a superior performance category. And it's so good, folks, that it will probably live with us until 2016. That's kind of good because up till now, we've had to change these every three or four years, as David referred to. Okay, in addition to CJ4, there are some other things that might be taken into consideration on oil. One is the engine manufacturers may require an additional specification on their part. For example, Cummins recommends CJ4 plus 2007 and newer uh, engines, they recommend CES 20081. Detroit Diesel, CJ4 plus 93K218 specification, Caterpillar, ECF3, Mac and Volvo, sharing similarities these days. It's Mac EOO and Volvo VDS4, and you could go on, uh, John Deere, CJ4, Navistar, CJ4, and so on. But beyond CJ4, there may be additional engine manufacturer approvals or requirements to further explain to the consumer what they believe is the best way to lubricate their engines. Okay. So I want to share with you one last thing as we leave this, the API category. One thing that's probably in our industry difficult to discern is when we say CJ4, how good is CJ4? And being that most reputable suppliers of heavy-duty lubricants have multiple choices in CJ4, one might quickly come to the conclusion, well, if it says CJ4, it's all alike, right? Not quite so quick. 
I'm going to share with you one of the several industry standard tests that are used to create a fully licensed and approved CJ4 oil technology. And I'm just going to share one of these with you. We don't have time to go through the multiple tests that are out there, but did you know that, for example, in the Cummins ISM valve train wear test, which is a merit rating test where a brand new engine is rated at 2,000 merits, that's a brand new engine, spanking clean as they say, but you can be a CJ4 oil and pass at 1,000 merits, which means there's a lot of headroom left over if you wanted to achieve ultimate performance in a CJ4 oil. In fact, the red bar on the right shows you where a premium CJ4 can come in at if you chose if you choose to go that route. Now, you say, well, okay, what would cause me to want to consider the blue alternative versus the red performance? Well, it's simply this. How long do you want to keep your, how long do you need to have your engine last? If you've got to go a million mile engine or more, you might want to think twice about what's out there. If you have to consider the cost of downtime, parts, and labor, you might want to think twice. And if your oil change interval can be a cost-saving opportunity, you might want to look beyond just whether it says CJ4 or not. Don't be afraid to inquire from your lubricant supplier what the differences is in the choices they have available. This could be very important to you. Okay. Well, let's talk about low viscosity oils on the brink. That's a topic that's coming on strong. Now, f folks, the thing about fuel economy, I talk to many, many transportation managers. If you go to isolate any one thing, you might get buried in the idea of what any one item can contribute to fuel economy. But we know first and foremost, speed is huge. I think I've heard where one mile an hour can add up to one and a half percent increase or decrease in fuel economy. The driver habits and behavior are critical. The loads, the aerodynamics, the tires, both the design and how well you maintain the tire pressure. The logistics, whether you're driving across the beautiful plains of Kansas or in the beautiful Rocky Mountain states, that can have high impact on your fuel. Operating conditions, of course, engine and engine idle time, and the drop and the drivetrain. But what we want to narrow down now is what in the world can engine oil have to do with fuel economy? So let's first talk about You've probably read an article or maybe have seen an article in the various trade journals out there about more and more recently about the impact of fuel efficient heavy duty engine oils on fuel efficiency. I thought I would show you first of all let's let's talk briefly about what a low viscosity oil is. And you would compare basically what we're comparing is to a conventional fifteen oil. A low viscosity oil is one where the viscosity grade on the winter grade is lower. One way of looking at it, it's lower than a 15W oil. We have examples here. 10W30 would be a lower viscosity than a 1540. A 540 on the low end would be lower viscosity. A 530 and a 10. Those oils are all in the market now. And what I've attempted to do here is explain to them how they are marketed. A 1030 can be a conventional, in other words, non-synthetic. You can have a synthetic blend, a full synthetic with a 540. Most of those today that are in the market are full synthetic oils, as well as any 530s that are in the market. And the last one, it can be conventional synthetic blend or full synthetic. Now, what I've done here is attempt to compare them as a fuel economy rating based on what we know in the industry now. And I know this is always subject to discussion and maybe even debate. But 1030, I've given, based on fuel economy rating, I, the number of X's means the better the fuel economy that could be provided by this oil and diesel uh, engine. I've got three X's on the 10W30. You notice on the 540, I've got two X's and then a little red X, which means it's about two and a half. I, uh, I guess there's a little bump that we give to 1030 just on fuel economy alone, uh, so I've uh, portrayed it like that. The 530 would be best in class, four X's, and then a 1040 would be an X. So that kind of gives you a relative indicator of what would be expected of these different viscosity grades 
in their contribution to fuel economy. Now, there's another thing that should be considered here real quick, and that, that is temperature application range. Now, if you look at that, there's a little difference there. The 540 actually gets four at uh, 4Xs, and I will support this here in a minute. What I mean, that's the temperature range from startup of the engine to the highest ambient operating temperature that the oil will work at. My footnotes say that all these grades, you'll, you, you will hear anywhere from 1 to 5 percent based on viscosity grade, fleet type, operating conditions, and the rating compares temperature operating range as recommended by the engine manufacturer as of today, Detroit Diesel does not approve the use of a 1030, but it's believed that that may well be changed here in the near future. Um, I want to share with you, just to put a little support behind this, I've taken one major engine builder's viscosity recommendations for your review. You notice that the 1540 by Caterpillar is recommended for a range from 122 down to plus 15. Now, that's interesting, because below plus 15, one might say, now, if you live in Florida or where I'm at right now in Houston, I ask, so what? If you're in International Falls, Minnesota, plus 15 develops a whole different meaning. That means that the oil pump is having great difficulty picking up oil and delivering it to the engine, anything below plus 15. A 1040, 1220, 1030, 1040. But the 540, interesting has the same high temperature rating as a 1540, but it takes you down virtually 37 degrees lower fluidity. We've done coal box testing on the 540 and found that it, the oil is picked up five times faster at 32 degrees, let alone minus 22, than a 1540. This could be of interest if you're in that kind of environment where cold can have impact on you. All righty. By the way, poor point is a specification that you'll see published, but poor point of 1540 oils may range from minus 15 to minus 35. Poor point is just the lowest temperature the oil has some degree of mobility. That is not, and I repeat, not the safe lubrication range of an oil. All you have to do is look at Caterpillar's recommended range for 1540 and you can tell yourself real quick that you can't depend on pour point for what is the recommended lubrication range. This next slide also shows anything to the right of the yellow bar is the safe zone. As you go from 32 down to 15, you see that the 1540 becomes borderline on safe zone. At zero, we lose the 1540. Even 1030 becomes borderline, but 540 hangs in there all the way down to minus 20 from a cold temperature perspective here. Okay, having said all this, these are things as we move forward, these are things that will become part of the conversation between fleet managers, lubricant suppliers, and engineering. Engine durability and wear protection, that, that would be on the mind of everybody as we talk about low viscosity. Will my engine manufacturer recommend or support the use of a low viscosity engine oil? How will low viscosity oil impact my engine warranty? How will low viscosity oil affect oil consumption and oil pressure? What about older engines in my fleet? And how will I know a low viscosity is actually improving fuel economy? Folks, these questions have already come up in the dialogue between fleet managers and oil suppliers. And I can say as we move forward, I am confident that we will have good answers and have good answers to these questions. But I wanted to make you aware, even though time will not, not allow us to go in depth on these, there are answers to these. So I encourage, if you are a fleet manager online, I encourage you to ask these questions of your oil supplier and make sure that you get a thorough answer on these things. Okay, let's take a quick break as we narrow the end of our presentation. Which of the following do you believe are concerns for equipment owners when changing to a low viscosity? Heavy duty Angela. I wanted to reinforce this so much that I followed it right back up with a question. Number one, engine manufacturer warranty might be a question. Engine protection and durability. Cost versus a conventional SAE 1540. Verification of fuel economy benefits or all of above. I'm going to get, give you about 20 seconds here. Think about it a minute. Submit your answer. And, uh, 
On the last question, you were quite excellent. So let's see how you do on this one. Okay, the answer is all of above, because you, if you're a transportation fleet manager, you will likely have questions about how low viscosity oils will impact your fleet. And if you're a supplier, you will probably be asked these uh, questions down the road. So it's important to, to be prepared to know how to answer these, these questions. I'm going to finish out today with a ending thought on engine oil and basic economics. We so often in the industry, lubricants as a part of the variable operating budget today. If you look at the cost of keeping these fleets on the highway, 97% is tied up in fuel, labor, maintenance, and tires. Lubricants is about two or three cents out of every dollar invested in the variable operating budget. The importance to understand there is where do you place your emphasis when you go to choose a lubricant? In 2008, unfortunately, a thousand trucking companies went out of business in the first quarter. That was based on several factors, but a lot of it had to do with the fuel changing of the time the pricing. You can seek out a product that is designed just to be purchased based on a spec and a price point, or you can look beyond a selection of products in the market today offered by almost every major supplier. You can seek out a product selection that will impact actually 90% of your cost area. In other words, we've been talking about how you could save fuel with low viscosity technology or how you could reduce your labor or maintenance costs due to optimizing oil change intervals safely and protecting your warranty. Or just plain and simply extend the life of a diesel engine. It costs about $30,000 to replace a diesel engine today. So if you're one of those people that have to go as long as you can between an in-frame overhaul, your selection of product becomes very important as a part of your maintenance protocol. But at the end of the day, I think it's always important to know where lubricants fits in this. Unfortunately, those thousand trucking companies that went out of business, if they had been able to get lubricants at no cost or free oil, it would not have made any difference in their operation because that's just where lubricants fit. So the moral of the story is be discriminate and selective in what you choose because there are multiple choices within any brand, which one is right for you, and it may be the one that could really save in that 90% area. Last slide here. What are the potential annual cost saving benefits with a fuel efficient low viscosity oil? Well, fuel savings at 1.5%, which is pretty much a midpoint for those low viscosity oils we just talked about, can equal approximately $1,200 a year. And if you have 100 vehicles out there, you do the math on that, you're already up to $120,000. Anything, remember, that saves 1% is 800 so that's where we get the math there. Cold weather startup and wear protection, extended battery and starter life. We just showed you a slide that showed the endpoint of a 1540 oil. If you're one of those operations or you work in an area that typically gets consistently below plus 15, would you believe that every time you reduce a battery's amperage capacity below 80%, you shorten its life? And every time you overheat a starter because you're constantly grinding on it to get it started because the oil is like molasses, you're going to shorten the life of the starter? and reduced dependency on electrical energy consumed by block heaters. Average in America, kilowatt energy is about 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So if you have a vehicle plugged in for 10 hours, that's a dollar a day times the number of vehicles you have. Now, I'm not, 
I'm not proposing that you totally eliminate the use of block heaters, because in some severe cases you need that auxiliary help. But I've had bus fleets that ran as much as 3,000 school buses that once, in, with using a 1540 oil, had to keep them all plugged in every day for 10 hours at the cost of a dollar a day per bus, $3,000 a day times $100. That's $300,000 in electrical energy. When they changed to a low viscosity technology and gained other benefits, they discovered that minimally they eliminated the use of block heater in that fleet. Tremendous cost savings there. And last, reduce greenhouse gases and reducing the carbon footprint. And, and by, uh, by the way, that 1.5%, $1,200 per power unit was based on 100,000 miles a year line haul, class 8, at 6.5 miles per gallon. Well, folks, last thing I want to mention to you, if I've raised your curiosity about this low viscosity oil and what the potential in a fleet might be, you have an opportunity here confidentially and you can personalize your own cost saving calculation by going into sitcohdlubes.com. You go in there privately and you just tell that, uh, that website how many units that you operate what your present fuel cost average is, what your average miles per gallon is, how many miles on the average you drive a vehicle per year, and it will calculate at the touch. All you do, if you can see it there, it says calculate savings. It will show you what the impact of a low viscosity fuel efficient engine oil can have on your fleet. There must be uh, a lot going on because we've seen a lot of interest in this, and as I've uh, Tempted to explain in the years in the years leading up to 2018, there's going to be more and more focus on the contribution of engine oil. Why should we be so surprised? Factory fill. Several of the major automotive engine builders factory fill zero twenty or five twenty. For what reason? Corporate average fuel economy. So this world is coming to heavy duty diesel. And I want to thank you for your time today. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to David here and stay online. And once again, thank you for your time, folks. I've enjoyed sharing some information with you. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, great job on imparting uh, technical information in an easy-to-digest and understand manner. And I think only a tribologist would use the term <laughs> happily lubricated, which can be, uh, I guess, transferred into uh, evening life. But uh, be that as it may, it was a great presentation. We've got just a ton of questions. So with time uh, running down, let's move right into it. Question here, do the fuel economy ratings deteriorate toward the end of the oil change service interval? That is an excellent question, and I mean that sincerely. What I believe this uh, qualified question, th this is a qualified qu question because I, I sense that the person may have uh, utilized or uh, offered oil analysis in the past. What we know, what can happen, uh, and, and why this is a good, good question, as oil ages, two things, well, several things can happen to, to deteriorate the oil, but, but one area of change can be oil thickening. Remember, we talked about soot loading, and a thing we didn't spend much time on at all, if, if any, the word oxidation. Oxidation means that the oil is... Oxygen is having its way with the hydrocarbon, which is what oil is, and oxygen is causing that oil to turn into bad players like varnish and sludge. So as oil ages, impacted by operating temperature and heat, you can have oil thickening, and the soot lo uh, that lows into the oil can cause oil thickening, and that can take you in the wrong direction, and that could have, as, as the oil ages or the drain interval is extended, that would likely impact your fuel economy. But remember, everything's relative. If you're comparing viscosity grades, 1540 to 540, the same thing will happen to a 1540. Uh, I don't mean to wear this question out, but we saw the impact of winter fuel versus summer fuel, but we always saw an advantage of the low viscosity technology, always showed an MPG improvement over 1540, regardless of what the variables were. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Another question, how will oils of the future 
lubricate in older engines, say uh, engines that are 10 to 20 years old. Okay. I anticipated that one. As long as we don't go back to the PC era, which is, stands for pre-combustion, I think that we've had enough experience now with engines within the uh, 80s and 90s to know that, that there won't really be a negative impact. And I think the two things that people look at is oil consumption and oil pressure and so on. Now, having said that, any engine where you have the piston ring liner liner relationship, if you've got heavy wear in there, no oil is going to put metal back on those parts. So if you've got one already thirsty for oil that's that's gulping some oil behind those ring packs, uh, low viscosity might even aggravate that a little bit. But but if it's a relatively healthy engine and you're not having adverse oil consumption now, you shouldn't see a bad effect in an older engine. And that's what we've witnessed in the field. There's always exceptions to everything, but I think that we can say that with some degree of confidence. Okay, the next question, um, and this is an interesting question. Um, one of the uh, viewers wants to know that if you keep uh, engine oil in a sealed container, never been opened, you know, sealed at the factory, uh, and you leave it for a year or two or three, uh, will it go bad? And uh, does it make a difference between if it's full synthetic oil or a conventional oil? What's the shelf life? Well, the shelf life... I think you ran the range up to three years. We feel that's that's good. The key thing about storing oil is to keep things on the outside that should be on the outside. Uh, the additives that are in there do not deteriorate uh, to any measurable degree. Uh, it, it, I mean, it's remember I said heat is the primary catalyst behind causing oil breakdown. And unless the oil was stored at 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Oil would last a long time in a sealed container. The, the key word is sealed, and sealed where even sealed on the outside can be a problem because there can be a vacuum effect from sunlight to cold evenings where you can pull moisture right through a, 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 a drum bung even if, if water collects on the top and it's not tilted over. So that's a housekeeping, that's a great housekeeping question, but it requires a little more uh, detail. But the, the other part was synthetic. Well, synthetics are naturally more stable, especially the synthesized hydrocarbon type, poly, you know, PAO, for those that go there, group, uh, group fours. One of their natural abilities is to resist the evils of heat over time and, and, and cause those problems we talked about earlier. So. Uh, under any condition, a synthetic would have an edge over deterioration, uh, especially if the catalyst is heat. Okay. Okay. Another question here: uh, If a if an engine is factory filled, and it's say with a high viscosity oil, and later on, I guess within the warranty period, the fleet changes to a low viscosity oil, will that have any effect on on warranty claims? No. Uh, I didn't go into quite enough de detail, but I encourage three things here real quick. Make sure that you know what your engine manufacturer recommends in the way of viscosity rates. Remember, I shared the, vis the viscosity recommendations by Caterpillar. Uh, they, they offer a variety of choices that are all acceptable. Uh, but the other part was factory fill, high viscosity, later on low viscosity. It might be surprised to some folks how many engine builders factory fill with 10W30, what would be classified as low viscosity. Why do they do, do that? They're worried about their engines getting in cold, especially new engines that are in the break-in mode. They're worried about en engines getting proper lubrication under cold conditions. And uh, kind of interesting thought there, huh? Yeah. Low viscosity is much more acceptable than people think. It's it it you know as long as you know what your engine manufacturer is saying, it does not violate warranty. It does not hurt you know. It's it, it's a uh, much more accepted viscosity range than pe uh, people think. Thank you. Okay, um, this is an interesting question for dedicated heavy duty trucks that are powered by natural gas. Mm -hmm. Can the same type of potential savings exist from the uh, the use of these better oils? Well, that's, uh, I hate to sound like a broken record saying every question is a great question, but yeah, it really is. Actually, 
I did not deliberately touch on CNG LNG. Uh, CNG, yeah, 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 CNG is a wonderful alternative because, I mean, if you read the reference material on CNG, comparable to diesel fuel, we could we could decrease fuel consumption by a four, by about fourteen hundred gallons of diesel a year if we went CNG. And what's not not to like? That's just the start of the advantage. the the uh, The emissions are even better on. Uh, CNG, but I think what the nature of this question is, if you have a 1540 CNG uh, and you went to low viscosity, uh, would there be a benefit? Well, yes, there would, because what I didn't probably do a good job of explaining, where is the energy loss in the oil itself? It's the, fr it's the internal dynamics of the friction within the oil. Remember, a diesel engine, about 1,400 RPMs. A minute, and this is a bad analogy, but if Michael Phelps had to swim in 1540 and his competition had to swim, got to swim in 540, I guarantee you he wouldn't have got eight gold medals. Okay, you got me? <laughs> okay, uh, we got time for about one more question okay. here. Uh, and this, um, this uh, listener wants to know, you know, what effect do uh, the filters have on um, the long-term running and, you know, keeping the properties of oil because it seems, they say, that the oil filter technology may not be advancing as fast as motor oil technology. Well, I'm going to be guilty again, David, of saying that I love these questions. I like this one. This is one of my pet questions. First of all, filterology is a very important part of all internal combustion lubrication. I mean, let, let's not, I want to get that out there first and foremost, but I want to share a couple. Of, first of all, there's different types of filter composition, and I'm not trying to be an expert on filters. We don't manufacture filters, but I am familiar with the process of what goes on to filtration, filtration efficiency, and so on. There are cellulose-type filters, and there's synthetic composition filters or microglass or whatever that are uh, reported to last longer and resist the breakdown from heat over time. But I'm going to throw an interesting thought out here, just a second, for the group. Soot is probably one of the primary things that you trap. Now, wear metals is submicron. You know, a human hair is one-fortieth of a of a, of a micron. So we're talking small here, folks. Now, a soot particle is less than a micron as long as the oil keeps it dispersed and ganging up with its other soot buddies. You got me? As long as the oil additive technology keeps the soot separated and dispersed, the soot remains in filterable levels. Does that make sense? Okay. So most filters today, 10 microns or above, so you have to ask yourself a little bit of a question here. If the oil becomes, if the dispersancy of the oil additive technology gets exhausted and it can't handle any more soot, the soot starts to thicken up and clump up and agglomerate. They like to use that fancy word agglomerate. And, and, and then at that time, the filter really starts to take hold and grab stuff and keep it, at, you know, keep it trapped. But the big question there was, which comes first, the oil's exhaustion from not being a hamel soot or the filtration? So so I've kind of gone around Robin Hood's barn of answering the question, but at the end of the day, the oil, this is the best thing I can say about the answer to the question. The oil and the filter are joined at the hip. The filter is heavily dependent upon the dispersing, soot dispersing ability of the oil and its ability to how long it can, uh, can disperse it. You can't override Either one, okay? And I probably confused everybody on. on. Well, that'll make them keep an eye out for, for the next <laughs> website. Yeah. Mark, you did, a, you did a great job. I'm sorry yeah. to say our time is, is almost up. I just want to let everybody know, again, that this uh, webcast will be archived on Fleet Maintenance Magazine online in the Media Center under the webcast section. And we want to thank all of you for taking the time to participate in the Heavy Duty Engine Oil, the Road Ahead webcast brought to you by Sitco Heavy Duty Lubricants, the maker of high-quality Sitco lubricating oils. And Mark Bittner, again, thank you. And everybody, have a productive rest of the day. Thank you all. Appreciate it.